Hello, everyone, and welcome to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and I'll be your host as we explore events that have happened on Delmarva. Delmarva is an area in the Mid-Atlantic region of the United States that encompasses all of Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. And what I do is I explore anything from natural and man-made tragedies or disasters to you know, true crime that has happened here. Today, we actually have a very interesting case that you know covers actually a lot of ground, not just Delmarva, but that was really the focal point of this investigation. But it's very intriguing, more than a little complicated. So if this episode goes like a lot of the investigation and any other articles or documentaries that I've watched, we all may have more questions by the end of this than we have answers. And that's why it remains you know, really one of Delaware's most mysterious cases, even after 11 years. So before I get into the episode today, I just want to mention a couple of things. One is I do have a new microphone, so I have tested a few in the past and they didn't always come out. Um, the sound didn't come out the way that I wanted it to. I understand it was at times a little distant or tinny, so I apologize for that. I did try to work with the sound as much as possible, um, but I just kind of have a limited system here. But hopefully this one will work better. If you do have any feedback regarding it, whether it's better, worse, um, any, please let me know. I'll have all of my contact information in the description of the episode. Also, I do record this to not only have a podcast, but be uploaded to YouTube. And that's so I can add more visuals, whether it's graphs, maps, pictures, you know, anything that might enhance the story. So um, if you do have a chance and you want to go over and take a look at those um, pictures or any other, you know, sources that I have, um, please do so. I think in this case specifically, it may help to see some of the maps and show distances from different locations. And if you do have a chance also, and I don't always bring this up, but it can help the podcast grow or move forward depending on how you're listening, whether it's through a podcast app or YouTube, if you know you do have the option to like, subscribe, or leave a comment, that helps move the episodes or podcast altogether up into um, like higher in the search field or search engine. So if someone searches for certain topics, you know this will be easier for them to find. Now, any episode that I cover can depict injuries, death, or other events that may be triggering for some. So I do just want to, you know, let people know that before we start to get into the episode, you know, in case it sounds like something you may not, um, you know, really be interested in hearing about. Usually I do put the podcast episode up before the YouTube episode, just because of the editing involved, but you know, I want to get the podcast out as quickly as possible. So usually I'll upload that first. So if you are looking for the video, it will come out a little bit later, um, usually within 24 hours, most likely less. So all of my sources will be listed in the description as well as my contact information. There was one episode of Netflix of an Unsolved Mysteries episode that I did watch. Usually all of my sources I glean from you know, sites that don't have a paywall to them, but with Netflix, you know, it's a streaming service and I thought it was important to review the episode as it actually did provide a couple of pieces of information that I didn't know about before, you know, even though I've known about this case for years. So with all of that being said, let's get into the case of the death of John Parsons Wheeler III. Now, when I say that, it might not really ring a bell. This case was pretty major at the time, but you know, it may not necessarily be a name that everybody knows from seeing on the news. But if I say Jack Wheeler, that might ring a few more bells. And that's what he really went by. And so before I get into the details surrounding his death, 
Let me give you some information about his background and history, as well as a number of his accomplishments. So going forward, I will be calling him Jack, as that's what he preferred. He was born in December of 1944 in Texas. He came from a military family and was actually born while his mother was staying with her mother, as his father was serving overseas in World War II. Five days after Jack was born, his mother received a notification that her husband was missing in action. So his poor mother, you know, just had a baby. I'm sure she's elated at having this beautiful baby boy, but then all of a sudden hearing that it's possible her husband won't be coming home and won't be able to meet his son. But fortunately, he was found so the family could reunite. He did go to the U.S. Military Academy, um, West Point, attended Harvard Business School, as well as Yale Law. He served in Vietnam in a non-combat role, and eventually, after his military career and a couple of you know, private sector jobs, he did work his way into politics. He was chairman of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund for 10 years, and there he faced some opposition regarding the style and design of the um, Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, some people did not like Myelin's design. Ross Perot was probably the most notable name who was in opposition to the design, but Jack was able to you know, use diplomatic means and was able to come up with a compromise so that Myelin's design could still be used, but you know, some additions were made that made you know, the rest of the people, you know, more comfortable with the design. However, he also faced other controversy in this endeavor. He once was accused by a television reporter of misappropriating funds for this project. And this did trigger an audit, but the audit found that, you know, Jack was clear of all of the accusations that the television reporter was making. So after all of that was said and done, the television station actually, you know, issued a mea culpa and even donated towards the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. So, you know, a lot of television stations or newspapers, if they need to print a retraction or an apology, it's not usually so clear and public. You know, you have to go to the back of the newspaper or at the very bottom of an article or something like that. But this seemed to be very public, which you know, shows most likely he was completely clear. It wasn't just, you know, they weren't able to find anything to, to prove there was misappropriating of funds. It just sounded like he was completely clear. And I don't know where the reporter would have gotten his information. He also was an official in the Securities and Exchange Commission. He helped establish the Earth Conservation Corps. He served as CEO of Mothers Against Drug Drivers, and he also served as a presidential aide under the administrations of Presidents Reagan, George W., and George H. W. Bush. So, you know, he really was kind of a mover and shaker in the Washington political scene. So this is one of the reasons why when he was found dead at the very end of December 2010, it really was a big news story at that time, which we don't hear as much about it anymore. But right after it happened, you know, he had very influential friends. He was very influential just overall in some of the things that he had accomplished during his life and was actually still working at that time as a contractor. And I will get into that in just a moment. He was working um, at or as a contractor at a company called MITRE Corporation, that's M-I-T-R-E. That is listed as, and I quote, the MITRE Corporation is an American not-for-profit organization with dual headquarters in Bedford, Massachusetts and McLean, Virginia. It manages federally funded research and development centers supporting various U.S. government agencies in the aviation, defense, healthcare, homeland security, and cybersecurity fields, among others. He was working in the cybersecurity division, so he still had pretty high government clearance. Now, I did read in one place that MITRE did have 
also a uh, office in Delaware, which Delaware has what's considered very friendly corporate laws. So I would not be surprised to find that, yes, they did have um, an office in Delaware. So as I mentioned, Jack was found deceased in December of 2010, actually on December 31st, so the very last day. Um, he was 66 at this time, but like I said, he was still active working with MITRE and was active. So his death came as a surprise, not only for who he was, but the fact that the circumstances surrounding his death were very bizarre. Whenever someone dies prematurely, it's always a tragedy, but in a case like this, it may have not even made that much of a local coverage in the news, if not for who he happened to be. He was found in a landfill, and absolutely no one deserves that end. So the questions start to come as to how exactly he died. There are pieces of evidence that happened before his death, which, like I said earlier, may actually lead to more questions rather than answers. So there's kind of a timeline of three days that he can be seen on CCTV um, or verified doing certain things. And during those days, he was not acting like himself at all. He... He was diagnosed as being bipolar. His wife, Kathy, though, said he was very good about taking his medication um, and that she really just you know, never saw a side of him that showed the bipolar disorder. The fact that he did or was bipolar should not define who he was. And I don't want that to be a main focus of the investigation um, you know, that was occurring at this time or help cloud any of the ideas or theories that are presented on this case. But some of the theories do bring this up. Also, some of his friends and colleagues did in an interview, you know, say that this was actually in a way beneficial to him because he put all that energy into the work that he did. I also think that helped give him another perspective on things. I did see part of an interview that he gave where he discussed that when our service members come home from you know, serving in any type of combat, that they do have wounds that you may not necessarily see. So you know, really before you know, a lot of people discussed the support that some of our service members may need when they do come home, he was ahead of his time on that, and I think, you know, he did have a unique observation and, you know, for that time period, kind of a new perspective on things. So he was, he seemed to always be working on things that could help improve other people's lives. So, you know, he really sounded like he was devoted to his country and devoted to making improvements wherever he could. For the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, his wife, Kathy, and one of his stepdaughters um, were interviewed. I did find it interesting that there, were, there was no interview or discussion, really, of his other two children. Um, Kathy was his second wife, but with his first wife, he did have two children, twins, a boy and a girl. And then also he had two stepchildren with Kathy and his stepdaughter, you know, did describe it as, you know, he treated um, her and her sister the same. You know, he so he was a very, you know, family-oriented man, but he did travel a lot for work, and as such, he and Kathy had a home in Harlem, New York, but he also kept a residence in Newcastle. And I've mentioned before in some um, of the episodes that Delmarva really is centrally located so that we have a lot of major hubs to the north, south, and west of us between having Philadelphia and New York. You know, to the north, really not that far of a distance or a drive. Philly is really right there. And we have Washington, D.C. and Baltimore to the west, Norfolk um, to the south, and of course Dover Air Force Base, pretty much right in the middle of Delmarva. So, you know, 
living in Delaware or staying in Delaware when you have to travel back and forth to different places really is a good location. In fact, um, our current president for years used you know, the train to go back and forth from his home in Wilmington to Washington, D.C. So it's really not that much of um, a commute if you're going by train, which also then allows you to work while you're on the train. But you know, again, just to reiterate, I did find it a little interesting that his, um, his children were not interviewed or, or mentioned really in this um, Unsolved Mysteries episode. So the events leading up to his death began at Christmas at his home in Harlem with Kathy. He was there for Christmas. He had spent time with the family and Kathy really planned on him being at the New York home for a while. But after Christmas, Jack told her that he would need to be getting back to DC. And she admits on the interview that she was not happy at all. She does not hide that fact. So, you know, she's very straightforward in the fact that she was mad at him for leaving. But he did have to go back to DC. And this starts then a chain of events that really have not been unraveled to this point. On the 28th, he did go into Washington, D.C., and he was seen on an Amtrak that day. He gets back to his Newcastle home, and that's where things start getting a little blurry or fuzzy. And the exact offense can be interpreted in a few different ways. So get ready. We're going to go through a lot of information as far as what happened and how it could have played a role in his death. So first, his home was in Newcastle, the city. There is a Newcastle County and Newcastle City. His home was in the city. Um, Newcastle is very historic as you know, are a lot of locations in um, Delaware. There were actually three signers of the Declaration of Independence that were from Newcastle. Um, it's situated on the water, and there is a place called Battery Park, which is right there at the water. And Jack lived close to that, and there was a house that was being built across the street that would really block the view and detract from you know, the overall beauty um, and scenery of the area. Jack and Kathy were not happy about that at all. Um, they made no qualms about the fact that they did not want this house to go up, and they even filed legal proceedings to try to stop it. But unfortunately for them, that didn't occur, and the building of the house began. On the night of the 28th, the same night that you know, Jack is coming back from D.C. to stay at his Newcastle home, there is a, some smoke bombs that are set off at that house. And it's thought that, you know, the attempt was to destroy the property, to start a fire and, you know, try to stop the building of this house. More, more so where it points to Jack is his cell phone was found at the site. So that's another level here because Jack was always on his phone. You know, this was 11 years ago, but given the fact that he had to travel so much that he worked, you know, with so many high profile projects and needed to be available, you know, at the drop of a hat, he never went anywhere without his phone. However, this did not really um, show the importance until he was found deceased a couple of days later. So at some point between now or at this event, and when he's seen on the 29th on CCTV, he does reach out to his therapist. And this is where some of the timeline is vague, at least in everything that I watched and read. But he reached out to his therapist and he mentioned his fight with Kathy and that he had, you know, he didn't have his briefcase anymore, that it had been stolen. And Again, just like his cell phone, that briefcase is extremely important to him. So he was going through some difficulty in dealing with all of this. He was feeling very stressed that we do know. He also did reach out to MITRE because of the um, 
the briefcase going missing because, you know, again, he has, you know, high clearance, high priority clearance. His badge was missing. So these are very, very important items to him, to his work. And as his work is a national contractor, even to the government. So he was definitely stressing out. I would be interested to know exactly when these phone calls took place, as well as did they come from a landline? I believe he may have emailed one of the people. So you know, how exactly was this done? The reason why I'm bringing this up is creating a timeline for some of the theories. It's very important to find out when he made these phone calls and if they were with his cell phone. It is possible he might have had a landline, but you know, considering everything that he did was on his cell phone, I think that's going to be a very important factor, which is not entirely clear. So I mentioned that he was seen on CCTV on the 29th, and he showed up at a pharmacy that was local to his home, and that was the pharmacy that he did normally go to when he was in town if you know, he needed a prescription refilled or needed some medicine. So people knew him. When he got there, he was asking for help to get a ride into Wilmington. The pharmacist offered to try to call him a cab, but he declined. And he's seen on camera kind of shuffling out. He looks disheveled, at least to him, I would say he's disheveled because you know, this is a man who was very straight laced. He always looked, you know, very professional. And in this case, he's he doesn't look confident. He's kind of hunched over just a tad. And, you know, his clothes are you know, like not tucked in or anything. So he definitely looks different than you would think he would. Um, a couple of people do try to help him, but it's unclear exactly if he got a ride. You know, a lot of people do believe that he got a ride with someone to Wilmington. And looking at the distance, he definitely did need to get a ride. But whether it was from a person or from a cab or even a bus, we don't really know what happened in between there. He did make it from the pharmacy in Newcastle to a parking garage in Wilmington at the courthouse. Now... That is about a six mile trip. As I didn't have the exact address for the pharmacy, I just searched for Battery Park and you know, getting to that particular parking garage. So it's about six miles and it was a 40 minute time frame between when he left the pharmacy and when he got to that parking garage. So he could not have walked it. And at one point, somebody did come forward and say that they shared a cab with him but I don't know if that was in this particular instance or if that happened later on. So he was at this parking garage trying to find his car. However, his car was actually parked at the Amtrak station. You know, initially this may lead people to come up with a couple different ideas or conclusions regarding why he was at the wrong parking garage, but kind of across the board between his wife, stepdaughter, and friends, they state that he was horrible about remembering where he parked his car. They said it was not unusual for him to take a cab from the train station or take a cab home when he'd actually driven that day because he couldn't find his car. One of his friends described it to paraphrase, you know, that he only had so much room in his mind to, you know, to think about things. And he devoted all of that energy to his work. So at the end of the day, he didn't have you know, room to remember where he found um, or where he parked his car. So that was, again, just a paraphrase. So while I still find it a little unusual that he was completely you know, at a different garage, you know, I think he would remember if he you know, left it at the Amtrak station. Actually, early in his career, he did work for Amtrak as a senior planner. But I, I think he would remember that, however many people are saying it's not unusual. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt or, or not. A lot of people think that's very important. So I'm kind of keeping an open mind about, you know, whether or not it's entirely strange that he was at a completely different parking garage. 
Now, from that parking garage, though, he goes to the Nemours building. That is pretty close, you know, maybe about a five or ten minute walk, depending on how fast he's going. And so he's picked up on CCTV again. And based on what they see on camera, as well as um, as well as what some of the employees and people who were in that building saw, they think that he stayed the night in the parking garage. So Delaware does not get as cold as many of the other states, but still, we are not anywhere near, near warm in the winter. It is actually very frigid today. So, you know, in late December, he's staying in a parking garage, which, you know, depending on which theory you go with, he could be hiding or think he's hiding, or he could just be confused. We really don't know, but either way, it's, to me, it's just heartbreaking that, you know, he must have been scared to some extent. And he was alone that night and was alone for really the last hours of his life, except for possibly, and again, I say possibly, someone who may have killed him. The next day, December 30th, he is spotted leaving the Nemours building and he's wearing a black hoodie, which again, universally, everyone says is not him. That's not something he would wear, even though it is definitely appropriate for the cold weather. It's just not something he would have or would wear. So I do wonder where he got that hoodie. Um, he's next seen passing in front of the Hotel DuPont, which is really just next to the Nemours building. And then that's the last time he's seen on camera. The morning of the 31st, his neighbor notices that there's a window open in his home. The neighbor described himself as kind of a caretaker. You know, he watched out for the house whenever Jack was not home. So when he saw this, he was concerned. He went to the kitchen door and was actually able to access the kitchen. And it was in such disarray that he figured a burglary had to have occurred. Pretty much everything was everywhere. Um, one of the bigger pieces of evidence was um, a, a bottle of Comet, the cleaner, had actually been spilled and there was a footprint in there. Um, there were dishes that were smashed in the sink, um, you know, jars of spices, um, things, you know, just anything you would find in a kitchen was spread out everywhere and some things broken. So he called the police. Um, to come do um, a, a burglary investigation. But about that same time is when Jack was found. And one of the investigators named Lawson said that as he approached the remains, he saw this ring on his hand and realized that this was probably, you know, an important person. It was not going to be just a, a run of the mill case, again, to just paraphrase there. Once they were able to identify who was at the landfill um, because this gentleman who we know is Jack had his West Point ring on. He had a Rolex and he had his wallet, which contained cash. So they knew who he was and knew that he had a home in Newcastle. So the investigators reached out to the Newcastle police who reported then that they were actually on the way to investigate a burglary. So in this three day period, we have smoke bombs at the house under construction across the street. We have what appears to be a burglary occurring somewhere in that time frame after, you know, the smoke bombs, but before Jack is actually killed. It had been about 14 hours since he was last seen to when he was found in the landfill. So there was not a huge amount of time which actually did help the investigation because they were able to trace back approximately where the um, dumpsters were located that um, were dumped that day. And I admit I am having a very hard time discussing a person found in a landfill. You know, it, it's just, I just detest that thought that somebody would be found in a landfill for whatever reason, accident, on purpose. It's it's something I'm having trouble wrapping my head around, even though I know it happens. It's just one of the worst thoughts for me. Now, as the victim was who he was, there were a number of different agencies that were investigating this. You had local, you know, meaning Newcastle City, 
um, probably had the Newcastle County Sheriff's Office. You had Wilmington. Um, eventually, the town of Newark comes up, which I'll go over in a few moments. But then the FBI also got involved. Um, DEA, which I'm not sure why. ATF, I'm assuming that's because of a possible connection to the smoke bombs. But one of the investigators said that there were probably at least 10 different agencies um, you know, reviewing this case. And I can definitely understand that because you don't know which direction it's going to take or, you know, what parts of the investigation are actually relevant to his death or not. Even though his remains were found in Wilmington, we actually have to go back to the point on which um, his remains were picked up from the dumpster. Based on what they were able to locate and track um, the driver back to, because the driver was very quickly... Um, determined and was called back to the landfill. It looks like it was around New London Road based on what the driver said, and that's in Newark. And that's where um, there's a college. It's really a college town. So he said it was one of the you know schools that um, he picked up the dumpsters. And, you know, again, I'm just looking at, you know, some of the area and what the possible location may be. And it looks like it's around London Road. There were two dumpsters that um, were at the location. One was eight feet. The entrance, you know, it, the door that was on the side of the dumpster was a little bit higher. The six foot one, though, the door that entered, you know, from the side or was open from the side was really at a level where someone could either be placed into the dumpster or could crawl in themselves easily. The driver of the truck, it seemed, based on his, um, based on what he said, that he thought possibly Jack had gotten into the dumpster to help provide some type of shelter against, you know, the elements at the time. He said it was not unusual to have someone try to get out or to, you know, push the top of the dumpster open and start waving their hands, you know, once he started to. Um, empty the dumpster into the back of his truck. So this was something that was commonplace to him, which again, you know, it's very, very you know, heartbreaking that there are people who you know don't have homes to be able you know, to find warmth and shelter, you know, just from the elements. And, you know, like I said, it's very cold here today. So that's just, again, hard for me to even discuss thinking about that. Now we have a lot of information, but then how do we interpret it? What do we know and what do we need to find out? There are so many things that are open-ended in this investigation, and there are so many things that can either overlap or, you know, looking at the way it's interpreted could totally change a theory that a person has. So what I wanted to do was go over some of the most common theories that occurred or that some people think occurred. Um, I have a perspective that I didn't see anywhere, whether on the documentary or in any of the articles that I read. So I kind of put the pieces together in a different way, at least from any of the articles that I saw. There may be other people who have the same idea, um, but again, there are innumerable theories about this case. Now, the first thing that most people would think of especially if it was not someone who was involved in politics as he, as Jack was, is that there was a mugging. And a lot of people discount this because he had his Rolex, he had his ring, he, you know, had his wallet that had cash in it. So honestly, what type of mugger would not take his ring? Um, so that's a big factor. However, I'm also kind of wondering about his briefcase. So, again, that can, that can come back later. I, like I said, there are so many different aspects to this. His briefcase does play a role in many of the theories. So, most people look at the mugging as, well, they didn't take anything. But I'm almost wondering if it's possible that... Um, whoever mugged him may have taken the briefcase and 
when Jack either started to fight back or things got out of hand, that's all he took. To this day, the briefcase has not been found. And as you can imagine, it's probably contained a lot of sensitive information. There's also thoughts that a mugger would not put his body into a dumpster. But I think you also have to look at the time frame of the mugging. If he was actually mugged, was it, you know, before or after um, he made it home that night? So the way I'm looking at this is it could have happened at one of two times. If he had been mugged on his way home on the 28th and had possibly suffered some type of injury, you know, such as to his head, that could have made him very confused. So he would be missing his um, briefcase, and that's when he would make his call to MITRE. And, you know, pretty much at that point, he just became very stressed and, like I said, possibly with a head injury, and that was the precursor to everything that happened from this point on. In some theories regarding the mugging, the event happens like right outside of the dumpster or, you know, right or very close to the time of death. And that the other theory of, you know, the mugging happening later, they're saying that a mugger would not put somebody into a dumpster. I have a different idea or take on that, which I'll discuss in a moment. So in other words, there's a theory of mugging. Most people think it happened close to his time of death. However, I'm almost wondering if it happened before at the very beginning of this whole process. And that's what led to the disorientation. So you can take it one of two ways. And again, this is why it's so open-ended. The other option is a random act of violence. This shares a lot of similarities to the mugging theory. Unfortunately, there are people who just take joy from hurting others. So it would just be an act of violence. Looking at this, it again could have taken place prior to Jack getting home that night on the 28th or closer to his time of death. If this is the actual um, cause of death as a random act of violence, I... I would put it happening closer to when he got home that night on the 28th. And again, because of injuries that he received, he became confused um, and started to walk around different parts of Newcastle County and was caught on the CCTV, you know, looking disheveled and confused. So one of you know the theories, or I guess anti-theory to this, is that people don't feel that a random killer or random mugger would go to the extent of putting a body in a dumpster. That that seems like it's a professional hit. I don't really concur. I did an episode earlier on, it was called A Perfect Storm, and it relayed the case of two people, or two couples, I should say, that were spending time in Ocean City, Maryland. One couple, though, just wanted to kill someone. It was a thrill kill. And they killed the other couple. And what they did is they put remains in dumpsters just over the count or the state line into Delaware. And the remains ended up at the landfill in Delaware. So even though this was not a targeted and, you know, it was a random act of violence, it wasn't targeted specifically to a person for a specific reason but still they put the remains in the dumpster. This goes against other people's train of thought where they're saying, you know, nobody who commits a mugging or random act of violence is going to worry about disposing of the body. So I have different ideas about that, but these, I'm just going around or going to review a lot of the theories that other people have. So with these two, you can take it in a number of different directions. But these are the main theories in regards to it being more of a random act. We then do go into the idea that this was a targeted or professional hit, and that is actually used. Um, his wife had you know used the word hit um, or professional, I should say. Um, and so why was this targeted or why was he targeted? Who targeted him? And then, the answers to that question could be about anybody. There are theories that he was targeted because he knew too much 
and was going to you know spill the beans basically but that theory has been put forth about local state and national government saying that he knew too much about either one of those and that's why he was killed there's also a thought that he was targeted by a foreign entity um, mainly China and Russia are mentioned. And there was one other country that was mentioned, but frankly, that theory, I, I am not joking here. I am being very serious when I say if I clicked on the link that took me to that theory, I would probably end up on a watch list somewhere because it was so out there and making very specific accusations just in the title. And my thought was I'm not going to touch that. So those are theories about it being targeted. There's also an idea that he was killed because he lost the briefcase or it was stolen. So it, this kind of combines a couple of different theories, both the targeted and the random act of violence or mugging if his briefcase was taken. Then there's an idea that stress caused him to have some type of mental break, you know, leading to everything that happened um, from the from the first time that we saw him at the pharmacy, you know, looking disheveled and um, confused. See, this is where things get very confusing to me as well. There are some people who mention this theory, but then also say that Jack never would have gotten into a dumpster. So if the idea is that he became so stressed that he first, you know, tore apart his kitchen because that's what he would have had to do to explain the burglary, that, you know, he wandered through most of Newcastle County and then got into a dumpster, which would, you know, explain how he got to the landfill. Some of the same people who say this say he would never get into a dumpster. So it's kind of a catch-22. If you go by the idea that stress is what created all of the events that led up to his death, then we would have to take a look at him getting into the dumpster by his own accord. People also say that the injuries that he received were not, you know, compatible with the injuries he would have received in a dumpster. Um, he had he had some pretty major injuries. Um, blunt force trauma, um, part of his lung was punctured due to broken ribs, um, you know, just a whole litany of injuries. But I, on the other hand, think those could very well have been caused by the dumpster being both, you know, dropped from the dumpster into the truck and then from the truck into the landfill. So some people really when they look at this theory, they don't think it to think it through to the last point and he would have needed to get into the dumpster, yet many people say he would have never done that. Again, we're going around in circles on this. My thought is those same people who are saying he would have never gotten into a dumpster, those are probably the same people who would have said that he would have never slept in a parking garage, woke up the next morning and walked out of there wearing a hoodie. People, you know, said that the hoodie was not his style. But to go back even further, again, he slept in a garage. If that accommodation was not available and he was still wandering, still confused, and he could not get to a garage, the next best thing to try to keep the cold out as much as possible would have been a dumpster. So, you know, there's kind of some holes into that theory as well. Now, this theory I definitely do not, you know, prescribe to. That's me. I know a lot of people do, including his wife. His wife thinks that he set off the smoke bomb to the house across the street. Yeah. So I don't think he did because the theory goes with this idea here that he set off the smoke bombs at the house. He dropped his phone in the process, and then when he got back to his house, which is just across the street, he became so stressed that he, again, tore apart the kitchen, and that caused the downward spiral where he was then seen the next day wandering around Newcastle County. 
my thoughts on this really go back to a question I asked earlier, and it was when were those phone calls made? Because he dropped his phone supposedly, you know, at the house, you know, where the smoke bombs went off. So when did he make that call? When did he begin to have those stressful situations that sent him into an episode? That is a, you know, to me, that's a huge factor in trying to determine what happened, but that's not entirely clear. If he set the smoke bomb off and dropped his phone and the stress of realizing he didn't have his phone is what sent him in, you know, to that manic episode, did he use a landline to call his therapist to talk about how stressed he was? Since he was attached to a cell phone, I would think he would have used the phone. Um, the cell phone in order to make the call. So that would mean it was not stress from setting off a smoke bomb and losing his phone that led to the events that led up to his death. So you know, that's one part of the theory I don't agree with in the fact that you know where his cell phone was um, makes all the difference in this theory. And more on a personal note, just from reading about him and looking at all he accomplished, I think that he would have been too straight-laced, too law and order to actually set off those smoke bombs. Because again, looking at this theory, the, the episode began after the smoke bombs went off and he was stressed because he lost his phone. Now, if things were reversed and he was somehow stressed and started the manic episode prior to the smoke bombs going off, I would probably agree with the thought or at least the possibility that he could have set off the smoke bombs. But I don't think he did. If using this theory says the stress began after the smoke bombs were set off, I just can't believe that this very decorated and honored man would set off smoke bombs just because he didn't want a house going up. Yes, he was passionate about it, but, you know, if he had been caught doing that, his career would have been over, which then some people would probably say that's why he was so stressed. But to me, the timeline really doesn't work out because of the phone. There were two kind of minor theories, which I don't think are possible either. One is that he was hit by a car while, you know, he was you know, walking at some point um, that the driver put him in his car and then later went and put him in a dumpster. Well, I, I think that's kind of difficult because A, I'm pretty sure someone would have seen it, even though Wilmington's not like New York City, you know, where people are out all the time. It is a town that's still, you know, stays pretty busy. I think at least one person would have seen that. Um, also, he was not like a little teeny person. There would have had to have been at least two people in the car to try to move him. Again, that's just my opinion, but I just don't see one individual being able to, you know, drag him and pick him up to get him into a car. Um, kind of a splinter theory from that, or similar but not quite the same, is that he jumped from the car, jumped from a car heading from the pharmacy to the garage that somebody had given him a ride and he jumped. The, the timeline on this doesn't make sense to me either because he had started the manic episode prior to um, prior to going to the pharmacy. Secondly, with that timeline, he's seen later at the parking garage. So did he jump from the car and make it to the garage and the same people came and got him and put him in the dumpster? You know, that's the timeline just doesn't work at all with this theory um, because he was seen after he left the pharmacy. Now I'm going to get into, I don't want to call it my theory, but it's you know, the only way I can see a lot of these things coming together. Um, before I do start that, I just want to mention as far as the targeted hits or targeted killings, I don't think it could be any of those just because it was so sloppy. Some people say that it shows that it was a professional hit because he was put into a dumpster. I look at it in the complete opposite way. Putting him in a dumpster was 
and kind of sloppy to say the least. They left him in there with a Rolex, which has a serial number, which can be traced. He had a West Point ring on, which could be traced. He had his wallet on him, which of course had information in there that could be traced. So I think if it was a prof professional hit, none of that would have happened. You know, they would have tried to find a way as much as possible to you know, not identify him. They would have wanted to have at least a head start their biggest hope would probably be that nobody would ever find him in a landfill. But, you know, he was. So to not take a chance, I believe any professional job would have taken any identifying um, jewelry or information that was on him. So he would not be identified. And or they just could have tried to find a way so that the body was never found at all. At this point, his wife had not reported him missing, so nobody would have been looking for him, and that could have given at least a head start if it was um, was professional, but leaving a West Point, West Point ring on someone, I just think cries not professional. And I know I started to discuss my ideas a moment ago, but I did just want to make it clear about um, how I felt in regards to it being a professional job. I do just want to add, I don't know if it's just a feeling I got, but I didn't get a good feeling from his wife. I don't think she was involved in any way. Um, you know, I just don't see a motive or any reason for her to, you know, try to kill him. They apparently were very happy. But there was just kind of this vibe I got from the interview because some of the things, I don't know, just if you watch the Netflix um, Unsolved Mysteries episode, let me know if you kind of get that same vibe too. Like, is she being sincere in everything? Has she really thought everything through? You know, I, I think it's odd that she would accuse her husband of throwing a smoke bomb. Just kind of my feeling. But the way I'm looking at this and trying to put all the pieces together... There are two ways that this could begin. One is that he was mugged just of his suitcase coming home um, that night on the 28th and may have had a minor injury or may have been hit in the head, which, you know, caused him to be very, very upset. Um, after he gets home, you know, of course, again, he's upset about the briefcase. He makes some phone calls to his therapist, to MITRE Corporation. And after all that's done, he notices that people are across the street and it looks like they're messing with the house that's being constructed. Now, yes, he does not want the house to go up. That is entirely clear. He does not want the house to go up. But he's still someone who is very law and order, very straight laced. And so he goes out with his phone in his hand to confront those who are doing that some you know somehow there's this tussle his phone is dropped they may have chased him back to his house because they're now worried hey someone's seen us we might get in trouble and so the fight ensues in the house things are broken and you know they leave they may threaten them and say you know don't say anything but they leave and he's left there just losing his briefcase and badge a while ago, now losing his cell phone because he realizes it's not in his hand, and he begins to stress. From that point is where he starts to move around Newcastle County, um, going to the pharmacy, and then making it six miles to um, the parking garages, spending the night in the um, parking garage or tunnels of the Nemours building, until eventually, somehow, which is still unknown, he gets into the dumpster in Newark. He could have taken a bus because he did have cash on him, so he may not have been entirely sure about where he was going if he was confused. But he may have you know, gotten on a bus and he was dropped off somewhere in Newark. And when the night came, he was cold. And the only place that he could find shelter in was that dumpster. The next day comes along, the driver comes, picks up the dumpster, 
Um, Jack has already been injured. He has some injuries and the dumpster is not going to make it, you know, any easier. He did have a heart attack. He had blunt force trauma in a lot of locations and he had also suffered a heart attack. So the, the shock of him being picked up and, you know, this fear or knowledge that he was being dumped into a trash truck triggered a heart attack. And the rest is history. You know, I said that there are maybe two possible ways on this. We could possibly cut off or cut out the point that he was mugged at the very beginning of this scenario. He may have just accidentally lost his briefcase somewhere, which I would find unusual. But let's just say, you know, we take out the mugging and he lost his briefcase somewhere. And he's talking to his therapist, to MITRE. And when he's done, he notices the people across the street. And, you know, the rest of everything is the same, at least in this idea. Is it a perfect scenario? No, it's not. But none of the scenarios that I've gone over are perfect. There's so many pieces that don't fit together with each of the theories that I don't believe there's ever going to be a way for this to be solved unless someone comes forward. One person did come forward who said they shared a cab with him. But I believe that as a lot of people do not want to get involved in police investigations, that in this particular case, because of who he was and the government connections, I think it's less likely that someone will come forward, that they would be afraid that you know, hey, what if this was a targeted killing and now somebody's going to come after me because I said something or they might come after my family and they step back and they just never say anything again. So the idea that someone might come forward and, you know, say that they saw something after 11 years now, I do not see that occurring unless new evidence comes up somewhere or specifically his briefcase is found, which again, after 11 years, Anything that's in there, I would think, would be gone. So unless those things happen, we're not going to be able to find out what happened to Jack. What we do know is this very hardworking, intelligent, driven man who worked so hard, you know, in many things that have impacted people's lives was found in a landfill his last few days alive were filled with probably confusion, pain, stress. He was probably scared at times. Um, I didn't mention before at one point he was carrying his shoe. So he had lost his shoe. And, you know, he by carrying your shoe in your hand, you do look disheveled. You do look confused. And, you know, I also don't know how I feel about the fact that, yes, people offered him you know, to call a cab or offered him some help. But no one took it a step further when he said no, because I mean, you can't force someone to do something. But if someone is really acting dazed, confused, looking the way he did, would it be worth it for, you know, the pharmacist or the parking garage attendant to possibly call um, for help? You know, even to a non-emergent uh, police number just to say, you know, I think this gentleman needs help. Is there someone who can come, you know, kind of talk with him and see what he needs because he might say no he doesn't need any help but if he's confused himself not sure where he is him saying no he doesn't need any help isn't really valid he may need a lot of help you know even if it's just finding his home again but it, there's this line you know what how far should you go over a line um are you you know, invading somebody's privacy if you make that phone call. What will happen if that person's mad that you called the authorities to try to get him some help? So I'm torn about that as well. Um, you know, I'm hoping if I ever came across that situation, I would call someone for them to get help. But at the same time, you know, again, there's this independence of, you know, the individual not to be, not to have their privacy invaded. So... You know, I'm kind of on the line on that. So, like I said, this is a very intriguing case. You may have more questions now than you did as we discussed the case. 
So I would love, love, love to hear your feedback on this because it's just intriguing, bizarre. I can't think of any other words. Um, but in whatever case, Jack's family does deserve to find out what happened. While, you know, in a lot of cases, I don't think there can be 100% closure. There can almost be complete closure, but I think it would be very difficult to have you know, complete closure on anything like this, but at least they will have some answers to, you know, possibly how he was feeling those last few days, why he was acting the way he did, and they deserve that. They need to know why this happened to their father, because looking at the man himself, not looking at his work in the government, not looking at his security clearance, this man was still a husband and father. And those that were closest to him need to know what happened. So I'm hoping that if someone did see something that eventually, once they feel secure, that they'll be able to come forward and give that information to try to help solve this very complicated um, case. So I hope you all found this topic very interesting. Um, what I'll do... Um, is I do have some locations on Google Maps that I'll be putting the link to, but what I would do is suggest, you know, um, zooming in, just taking a look at, you know, the areas at or around where he was. There's quite a few different maps that I have, um, have reviewed because he basically went all around Newcastle County. Um, and so I think that's important for the timeline. All, the, all of the other sources as well will be in that description. And, you know, I, again, I'd love to hear your feedback on this one. I will be um, putting out another episode in about two and a half weeks. There are, you know, a number of different topics I'm looking at, you know, gathering information or sending emails. But I'm looking to go probably more towards a natural or man-made disaster. You know, I have a couple things in mind for that that I probably have done in that time frame, um, because my last two have been crime related. I'd like to get back to one that is um, more of the disasters that we can try to prevent after we've learned, you know, what happened and what caused them. I hope everyone has a great couple of weeks. I hope that, you know, I'll get to talk to you soon, that you'll tune in to the next episode and everyone have a great week. Bye.